Our scripture today is in Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 1. So if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn there with me. If not, the verses will be on the screen behind me. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight. And what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before the synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourself or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. This is God's word offered in its reading and its hearing, and together we give thanks. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Gracious and loving God, what an extraordinary gift it is. For us to be able to gather together around your word. For we know, we know your word uh, leads us in truth. It guides us in the way that leads to life. And in it, we are instructed your best for us. Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes, that we would see our ears, that we would hear our minds, that we would come to know and understand your word, your will, our hearts, that we would feel its power. And I pray in response that you would open our hands, that we would offer grace to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'll begin by saying that, that, that there's a, a, a line, a verse in that passage that might jump off the page if you're hearing it, maybe for the first time. Uh, it, it says that if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, uh, that it will not be forgiven. And so some of us have, have wondered, is there an unforgivable sin? And, and there, there's an entire sermon there, or at least a Bible study there. We're not going to spend uh, very much time on that. I do want to acknowledge, though, that, that to blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to reject the persistent uh, desire God has for a relationship with you and, and to, and to uh, persistently reject it throughout your life. Okay, and so uh, what, what it's saying is if you accept, if you publicly acknowledge Jesus as Lord, th- th- there is forgiveness. And you could even uh, have challenges with Jesus and struggles with Jesus. But when it comes to, uh, to this work that the Holy Spirit is doing, persisting in your life, uh, that is uh, labeled here as something that's not able to be forgiven. And so, uh, so we're going to set that aside. And, we're, and uh, we can have a Bible study on that a whole other time, and we're going to dig in. Uh, I have a simple question for us to begin with. Uh, what do you fear? And, and uh, so we're going to actually, like, I need you to find someone nearby. If you're, if you're by yourself, find a neighbor. Neighbors, be nice to neighbors. Find someone else. Uh, very quickly, turn to your neighbor. What do you fear? And I'm serious, find a neighbor. If Look around before you start. If there's someone sitting by themselves, bring them in. Bring them into the fold. Can turn around, there's not. What do you fear? Ready, go. Twos or threes or more? Oh, you know, husbands and wives don't even want to tell one another their fears. I mean, this is, this is a problem, all right? Honesty from the start. What do you fear? What are you afraid of? All right, now, 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 I heard someone say a mouse. That's not a fear. That's just gross, okay? 
mice are gross, but you're not really. Uh, and like someone said, spiders. I heard that, like, look, like a real spider that like 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 Home Alone style. I get that, but like a spider where you just like do that, and it's done. That's just gross. It's not really something. so. So I heard your fears. Now I need you to go one layer deeper. Uh, why are you afraid of that thing? Ready, go. Not just what, but why. Here we go. Why are you afraid of that thing? Peyton, turn around. You got Debbie right there with you. Turn around. There we go. All right. Oh, now y'all don't, y'all had a bunch to say about the what, but you didn't have a lot to say about the why. Maybe we just haven't thought about it. Maybe we're really not that scared of it. Why are we? All right, we're going to bring it back. So, so Jesus speaks very clearly to us in this passage about fear. And, and uh, whenever we think about the things that we just uh, described, that we are afraid of these things, uh, they, they in large part will um, be able to draw down to a similar root in one of two categories, both at the same heart. The first is uh, a group of things like heights or uh, edges, uh, which is like when you're hiking and there is an edge. So it's heights, but a little bit different, right? Uh, animals, particularly animals that might kill you. I had bad dreams for years about bears. Now I just want to kill a bear so that I could conquer that bad dream. But um, I, I'm not. That's not going to happen. I've given up on that dream. Some of you might have said drowning. All of those, when you kind of get at the, 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 the kind of drilled down level, uh, they're going to be something that threatens your life. And so you might be able to say that at the very heart of it is you might be afraid of death. And then on the other end of it, uh, there would be things that you might have kind of gone away from yourself and more towards others. It might have been more closely aligned with loss. You're afraid to lose someone you love. You're afraid to lose your, your, your husband or your wife, your parents, your siblings, your best friend, your kids. You're afraid to lose someone you love. I can relate to that right now. Um, on Thursday, I moved my daughter Addison into her dorm room, and then at some point Friday morning, she will say goodbye, at which point I will be nine hours away from my heart, um, and uh, that's a normal driving. I've already calculated. I can make it in seven hours and 15 minutes if need be, okay? Um, and that's being pulled over once along the way. Um, so, so... Whenever we think about that, these kind of relationships that are so dear to us, if we think about uh, what we're afraid of and we say loss, we're afraid that, that either we will die without them or they will die without us. And there is this kind of uh, grief that can begin to set in if we think that way. And so Jesus leans into to these very fears, and in this passage, he has three major themes that he wants us to, to consider, to journey through, uh, so that we could hear what place fear has in our lives and how we can best appropriate it, uh, and he is our model. The very first thing is that Jesus says for us, don't seek death. He's, he's not inviting us into rec reckless living. He's not saying, hey, you have uh, these fears, uh, totally dismiss them so as you will then live so far on the edge that you are inviting death. There are daredevils that live in this habit of being. Uh, my son likes to jump off of things, right? And so this is Jesus saying, don't jump off of that thing, Aiden. And so um, uh, that's... I'm, testifying for a moment. And, and you might be wondering, Jason, where is that in the passage? I don't remember hearing Jesus say, uh, don't seek death. So we're going to dig in together. If you have your Bible still with you, we're going we're gonna to walk our way to where we began in, uh, in Luke chapter 12, verse 1, because the setup for it really helps us to understand where Jesus is as he begins his teaching in Luke 12. In Luke chapter 11, verse 37, it shows that Jesus has been invited by the, a Pharisee into uh, the Pharisee's home. And verse 37 says, when Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited Jesus to eat with him. So Jesus went in and reclined at the table. Now, when you're invited to someone's home, 
and they welcome you in, and you know you're going to have a meal, you're going to stay a while. What's the, the, the typical proper thing to do? Oh, your home is so lovely. I'm so thankful for the invitation. Oh, where did you get that from? I would love to know, right? The, your decor is fantastic. Or this food, mmm, delicious, right? Like this is the kind of way we operate when we go into someone's home. Not Jesus. So what, what we have here is Jesus is reclining at the table with the Pharisees. And one of the Pharisees challenges Jesus' behavior, the way in which he approaches the meal. And Jesus needs to offer a word of truth for the Pharisees. And so in the following verses to the end of chapter 11, Jesus offers seven woes. Not like, whoa, but like, whoa, you know. Jesus offers seven woes. Four to the Pharisees and then three to the experts in the law who also would be religious leaders, but they would, be, uh, they would have another layer of authority when it comes to obedience to the law. And, and so Jesus, who's been invited into this home, who reclines at table, who gathers with them, he has a word of truth that, that he is convicted to share with them. And these woes are not easy to receive. I mean, if you hear Jesus speaking these over you, you might have some concern. An example, verse 44, this is one of the woes over the Pharisees. Jesus says to the Pharisees, including his host, Woe to you, because you are like unmarked graves, which people walk over without even knowing. And the host says, I'm so glad I invited you, right? Um, this was a moment of hard truth that Jesus was articulating because it was important to share that they had missed the good news of God's word. That they were, were so fixated that they couldn't grasp that God had something more, a heart, a will for transformation for the world. And so uh, there's another example. This is one of the ones for the lawyers, now, your translation might say that for the lawyers. If there's any lawyers here, I'm sorry. Uh, it's more like religious law experts, but for, for the sake of giggles, we'll just say this is for the lawyers. Um, Jesus said again in verse 46, And you experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry, and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. You're layering on all of this burden and all of this challenge. And you won't journey with them. You won't walk alongside them. You won't help them. You're so interested in burdening people that you forget what it means to journey in love with people. As we told the students, to love each other. And so what do you think the response was from the Pharisees and the lawyers whenever Jesus had to offer these seven woes of truth over them? Not good. It wasn't great. So in verse 45, an example of how they, they, they are dealing with these woes, in verse 45, one of the experts in the law answered Jesus and said, Teacher, when you say these things, you also insult us. We are feeling insulted. The, the, the truth of our actions, the truth of our behavior, and the convicting word that Jesus had to correct that behavior was felt received as insult. And so whenever, so that they, did, they didn't say, oh, Jesus, thank you for the correction. I'm ready to, to change. How often do we fall into that? Oh, Jesus, you have a good word for me, but that's not really for me. Um, that's for someone else. Just like the Pharisees, we fall into this, this trap and we hear from Jesus this word that is convicting and we receive it as insult. And so here's how the Pharisees ultimately responded to the seven woes right before we get into chapter 12 where Megan began earlier. In verse 53, verse 53 it says, When Jesus went outside, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose Jesus fiercely. And besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. 
So then when we turn the page and we get to chapter 1, it says, Jesus left the house and thousands of people gathered around him. They were trampling on one another just to get close to him. They were so eager to hear the word being taught by him. They were so eager to learn of the redemption available through him. They were so eager to hear of the healing and to witness the miracles. They were trampling one another to gather around. And Jesus, knowing that the Pharisees were now, uh, were now uh, threatening his very life, he gathered with his disciples and offered them a private word. Did you catch that? Verse 1 and 2. He says, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples. So what we have here, what we read this morning, uh, is a private message for Jesus' disciples. So if you're a disciple of Jesus, this is for you. If you call on Jesus as Lord and Savior, this message is for you. And he's, he's, he's leaning in and saying, hey, uh, I know that you have, have fear in your life. Fear is real. It's, it's a fight or flight human condition that, that we all wrestle with and struggle through. But... I'm going to tell you, do not fear, and I'm going to live that out in a model that, that, that might be shocking for those that would observe it. Whenever, whenever I go forth in the world and everybody knows that the Pharisees are, are coming after my life, whenever I say do not fear, it has some authority and power. But he left that setting and met privately with his disciples as the first response. He knew that the Pharisees had questions. In that moment, he didn't go back to them and say, let's have a debate. He's not seeking death, but he is saying, number two, do not fear death. Do not seek death and do not fear death. Brothers and sisters, in, in verse four, he, he could not be more clear. He says, I tell you, my friends, Disciples of Jesus Christ, I tell you, do not be afraid of someone, of those who could kill the body, but after that they could do no more. That seems crazy, right? Because it is so very natural for us to fear those things that can lead to death. If, if, if not, if we didn't fear those things, maybe we would behave recklessly, but maybe instead of fear, we're to acknowledge them because they only have temporal power. Jesus is saying it would be short-sighted to fear things that can lead to death, giving them power over your life because there is an eternity for you, my disciples. Do not fear death. Do not fear death. I was in Seattle um, a couple of weeks ago uh, with the Texas Methodist Foundation uh, with a cohort of learners. And we went to uh, an Episcopal church uh, that is on the lake there with like just a, a beautiful community. And the rector met with us and taught us. And the rector was, 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 was teaching us uh, about his community, about his ministry, and what he sees as, as uh, transforming the lives of those in his uh, congregation. But in order to set the stage, he described the community, the mission field that he served. And he said, this is tech central, right? This is Seattle, home of Google, home of Amazon. Like, like people here are, 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 are working to, uh, to create the future of the technological world. And he said, you know what my people talk about? What they're working on, what their lives are dedicated to. And I'm like, I don't know. Like the little flying machines that will deliver Amazon Prime to you? Like that's what I'm thinking, right? And he said, he said, no, my people are working on cyborg technology, this is the future that they are driving towards. He says that, that all of them are, are, are trying to be the first to be able to implant chip technology in humans so that humans can be smarter, faster, stronger, heal, and ultimately live longer or eventually, potentially, live forever. That is the aim of his community. 
So all of us are going to one day be Iron Man. Bing! Right? Like, uh, is that how it goes? With the little laser that shoots out? Um, you know, the, I, I was just like, wow, that's not in my day-to-day life. Like, I don't think about sci- like, like, like implanted chips in my mission field. But that's what the technological uh, community is talking about. And, and I was struck by this. Like, like this total emphasis on the body and the need for the body to be so, um, so preserved, so lasting that, it can, uh, th- that we can avoid death or at least delay death because we are so afraid of death. We are so afraid of death. And yet Jesus says, do not fear death because I have overcome death. I'm going to nerd out for a very brief moment. If you don't like the nerd moments, then like, hey, just check in on your phone, and I'll say, hey, we're back in a moment. All right, so, so in the first century, there was a rising heresy called Gnosticism, and it rooted in this idea that Jesus was not fully human, that Jesus was not actually in flesh incarnate, and Jesus was entirely spirit. And whenever he resurrected, it wasn't a bodily resurrection, it was a spiritual resurrection. And in so doing, we, as his followers, are actually all spirit, no body, so who cares about the body? And uh, if, if, if no one cares about the body, the body can be neglected. Uh, the body uh, can, uh, can be abused. Uh, in many ways, it led to hedonistic behaviors because we were all spirit, no body. It didn't matter. Now, Irenaeus and other church fathers helped to defeat this as, uh, as a heresy because Jesus was both fully human and fully fully divine, and and it was essential for him to take on the flesh so that in his flesh he could defeat through his divinity death. And now, like, take this parallel, right? So you have no body, all spirit, and now we are living in an age that is emphasizing all body, no spirit. A a, a world in which we are are, are so focused on how we could elongate and preserve the... the, the, um, the effectiveness of the body so that we now have a total neglect and and ignorance in what is the spirit, what is the soul. You know, a classic John Wesley question is, how is it with your soul? I began asking that question at Covenant about five years ago, and I remember the first time I asked some lay leaders the question, they were like, whoa, I am soul. Wow. Like just to be able to say, I am body and soul, and there is uh, there is the indwelling of the spirit in my soul. It's it has power, and so we are moving into an age, and I don't know what it will be called in the future or how it will be defeated. I pray it will be defeated, but but if we ever get to the point where we would say, well, Jesus wasn't divine. We don't have a soul. Jesus was all human and was adopted into God's family, and we can be physically adopted into God's family, but not our souls, and there is no soul, then that will break down. Because Jesus is fully human and fully divine, and we are body and soul, all redeemed by God's grace. It's essential for us to see this commingling and not allow ourselves to be so overwhelmed with the focus on the body that begins, I believe, with our fear of death. All right, so now we're back. All right, so Jesus says, don't seek death. Jesus says, don't fear death, but he also gives us instruction on how to live. He says, seek life that leads to life. Seek a life that leads to life. And it's in verse 6, 7, and 8, so we're going to walk through it very quickly and and, and find uh, this truth available for us. Beginning in verse 6, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? So he's just giving a comparison. Hey, this is like the cheapest marketplace animal you could buy. Five for two pennies, all right? This is a good deal. At HEB, you would say, wow, they got it on markdown. No, this isn't a markdown. This is just the value of these things. Five sparrows for two pennies, and yet, hear this, not one of them, not even one of them is forgotten by God. 
that every single part of God's creation, God remembers. And then he draws it to us and says, Indeed, the very hairs on your head are numbered. God knows that number. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than the sparrows. Here's here's what I want you to hear. Uh, You're worth more than the sparrows. God remembers even the sparrows. And if, if you're worth more, then God not only remembers you, God redeems you. God not only knows you, but he wants a relationship with you. God not only knows the numbers of hairs on your head, but he wants you to know his heart and will for your life. He has flourishing and good, pleasing will for you. And so he not only remembers you, but he redeems you. And in verse 8, Jesus clearly articulates that. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me, Jesus says, before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. You see, Jesus remembers you, knows you, redeems you, and has redemption for you. And he's inviting you into that redemption by calling on you and inviting you. Follow me. Would you follow me? Would you love as I love? Will you serve as I serve? Will you care for the least, last, and lost? Will you pursue me such that you will follow my will? Do you believe that I have your best in mind for you? Follow me and publicly acknowledge that. Not just in your prayer closet at home or not just in the silent prayers of your heart at church, but publicly acknowledge me. Go out into the world and carry the witness of my faith to others. And when you do, When you do, you have no fear of death because death doesn't have the last say. Jesus is saying to you, I have conquered death. I have defeated it, and forevermore I have life for you. Don't seek death, but don't fear it. Live a life that leads to life. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we thank you so much for, uh, for the, the, the way in which you articulate your word, your heart for us. Lord, that we are body and soul, that we have been given life, that you remember us and that you redeem us. Lord, I pray that you would move in us and prepare us to receive your comfort, your conviction, and your transformation. Lord, I thank you for uh, the time we've had around your word and for the work that it's going to do in us. Lord, as we continue in worship and we enter into this time of offering, I pray that you would bless uh, both the gift and the giver like that all that is done in this space and the time, the, the giving and the receiving, Lord, that it would be to your glory, honor, and praise. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.